Hello and welcome to another episode of A Rough Sketch of History. Today's episode, The Muse Are Gone Offensive, The Prelude. Um, so we've gone over a lot of background up to this point, and now we're actually going to be covering the battle itself proper. Uh, we won't be getting to the actual events of the battle, but everything that directly led up to it. So we are, um, after much, much prior discussion, to the battle itself for all intents and purposes. So let me bring in our, our pre-drawn map. I'll go over all of this information for you, um, but just to save time, I sketched it out beforehand. Now, uh, let's start by kind of looking at the overall situation of the Western Front. Um, I have that sketched down here. So uh, here we have a map of the front. This is the uh, English Channel. This dark line here is the Western Front. This dotted line here is the French-Belgian border. Uh, now notice that Germany is nowhere to be seen. This, all this fighting has been done in Belgium and, Germ and France. Um, this, these gray lines here were the furthest extent that the Germans pushed during the spring offensive. This is in 1918. Uh, here we have um, the city of Metz and here the city of Sedan. And we'll talk a little bit more about those things in a minute. And the American Expeditionary Force was stationed in this area. Now, let's kind of follow the events of 1918 up to this point. Um, the Germans launched a huge offensive in the uh, spring. And for the first time in three years, they broke through the Western Front. They, and you might look at this map comparatively and think, oh, well, that they didn't make it very far. Uh, but in the terms of World War I, they did. Um, the, the fighting was no longer in a series of trenches. They broke through the trenches, were fighting in open territory. And it was a terrifying moment for the Allies. Um, if the war started moving again, uh, perhaps the, the British could be pushed back into the English Channel, um, similar to what would happen in World War II. Perhaps the, the Germans could push towards and capture Paris. Maybe the French would want to end the war at that point. Um, it was a close-run thing. Um, but the German offensive was eventually stopped. And um, uh, if you want to have more information on how the Germans were able to um, break through this, if you go back to the uh, to the lecture that I had about the different tactics, they, the, the use of stormtrooper tactics was how this was so offensive, uh, effective. But it was very costly in lives on both sides, but particularly for the Germans. Um, so by the time they broke through, through the end of spring, the fighting was raging in summer. The German army was severely depleted. Um, it suffered massive casualties, many captured, and in the end, they had to give up all of their hard-fought gains and retreat back to their defensive lines, uh, where they had been fighting for years. Now, uh, the Americans fought in these uh, spring and summer uh, battles though uh, not, not nearly at the same numbers that would be in the Muse Archon, but they did play an important role um, in these battles, but they had still been fighting. Um, they had not been fighting as independent, fully an independent army. They had been given charge of small sections here and there, mostly under French direction, uh, simply because that's what the situation um, needed, given how quickly everything was moving. It, it wasn't planned for. There was no thought beforehand that the Americans were even ready to be fighting at this point, but uh, thrown into battle they were at that time. So, but these uh, spring offenses uh, had a major shakeup. Uh, first of all, the Germans were severely weakened. And second of all, the Americans had made a pretty good showing. Um, and it had given confidence to both the Allies and also um, American leadership that the Americans could start assuming more and more responsibility along the front. Uh, so um, there was a big change of plans now coming into the fall. The spring and summer battles are over, and um, now the, the planning for the fall would begin. Now the initial plan of the fall was uh, mostly to hold the line steady. The um, Allies have been planning for uh, their plan 1919, which was a major offensive, um, much larger than anything uh, you would actually see in the war, to happen in 1919, uh, where the 
um, joint American, British, and French forces would break through the Western Front and finally push into Germany proper uh, and take the fight to, to German territory. And this fall would be kind of a time to sort of prepare for that. They did that by, by pushing back these places the Germans had taken. And the Americans were given a specific responsibility that right here, in a pl place called San Miguel, there was what was known in military terms as Salient, a place where the front line juts out um, and could be surrounded on three sides. The idea was that the Americans would, would shrink this Salient um, or push it back to make it, make it flush and uh, then they would advance on to the city of Metz. And Metz was important because um, it was a, a, a fortified city. It had fortresses around it. And, um, <coughs> excuse me. And if the, uh, if the allies were to advance into Germany, first they would have to take the fortresses at Metz. And if they were to take the fortresses at Metz, they would have to close the salient at San Miguel. So this was what the uh, American battle plan had been. This is what they were gearing up towards. But now things had changed. The uh, situation at the start of 1918, uh, where the front line had remained static, had changed, and now things were very different. The Germans' forces um, were weaker than they had probably been the entire war. And the Allied High Command saw the opportunity uh, to maybe not end the war in 1919 with a massive offensive, but to end it um, in the fall and uh, winter of 1918 by destroying the German army in the, its weakened state. And here was the basic, uh, the basic plan of this. Um, so the, in World War I, supplies were brought in by train, mostly. Um, and uh, also a lot of horse and wagon. You'd be surprised, even up into World War II, um, horses and wagons carried a lot of the supplies during the war. Uh, trucks did exist at this time, but they were a relatively new technology, whereas trains had been around for decades. And these armies were massive. They needed tons and tons of supplies every day. Um, so the plan was that uh, the... There would be attacks all along the front, that the uh, that the French or the, sorry the British up in the north would start pushing in just as the just as the Germans had broken through the trench line in the spring in the fall, the uh, French and British would break through the trench lines, and the Americans would advance um, not as initially had been planned towards Metz but up towards the city of Sedan which was a major rail line that um, much of the tr uh, rail traffic coming in on the Western Front came through Sudan, where it broke off into much smaller rails, feeding supplies all up and down the line. So a big part of this plan did hinge on the success of the American forces, which were given that responsibility, because the German army would start falling back at this point, and it would get faced with a choice. If it gets its supplies cut off at Sudan, if they break through the line, it has essentially two options. It can stand and fight and it will be destroyed with allies uh, having the numerical superiority coming in from multiple directions and the Germans lacking supplies, or it'll retreat and it'll have to move back into Germany. Either way, it would be a big shift in the war, um, much more so than had shifted the entire war up to this point. And it essentially could be the battle that would end the war and um if you study world war one you know that it seems like that this promise gets made a lot throughout the war that this is the battle this is what's going to change it but uh this this um hundred day offensive as it was known as it would become known later um had a different feel about it this was a a not just a delusional thinking or, or over optimism this was a real chance to end this bloody war once and for all so you would think that everybody would be really gung-ho about this, that this, you know, uh, a war-winning attack with the Americans being able to play a pivotal role, you think the Americans would be excited about this. But uh, General Pershing, the commander of the expeditionary force, was actually quite frustrated. Um, first of all, they had been planning this attack on the salient for months. Uh, 
and all of a sudden they were going to have to turn their army on a dime and take a completely different operation. Um, and perhaps another army, perhaps the French or the German or the British army would be better able to adapt to this, but the American army was, was a green army. It was very inexperienced. Almost all of its um, officers and soldiers uh, you know, had only a few months of training. And also this was pushing back, this would be pushing the Americans in the heat of or the thick of battle in the fall of 1918, whereas the plan was that the Americans really wouldn't be engaging in, in massive operations until spring of 1919. So Pershing was worried that his army wasn't ready um, and that it couldn't adapt this quickly. But um, ultimately, uh, Pershing saw an opportunity here that instead of pushing back too hard against the Allied command, there are some things that he would he would get out of this. There were some, some things to be gained. Um, if you remember from previous videos, they were saying that there were, there were two things that the um, American army uh, needed to accomplish in the field for uh, President Wilson's goals to be met. They needed to have an independent army, which this situation gives them. The, the American Expeditionary Force has complete control over its operations. It has a, sp a specific operational goal that it has been given responsibility for. And the army needed to uh, do well enough on the battlefield to give Wilson um, a place at the table when the negotiation started. And this would give it to them. Um, by the Americans taking these rail lines, it essentially would uh, start the domino effect that could cause the whole collapse of the German army. Um, now, you might be wondering if you, sa you said, well, you know, if the Americans are, um, if the Americans are this inexperienced army that aren't quite ready for it, why would the Allies give them such an important responsibility? And um, you could really go into that, but I think, I think the short answer is, I think they thought that this would be a very difficult task. And if the Americans did it, that would be great. And if they didn't, then the battle would still probably go on anyway. Um, but as you will see, this, this was going to be a difficult, difficult situation. Um, and whoever was going to do this attack, it was going to be costly. And I think the Americans had both the morale and the, the numbers uh, to try to attempt such a project. Um, but... This project here to shrink the salient, this was sort of Pershing's pet project and he did get permission from the uh, Allied High Command to execute this this battle at, at San Miguel um, just shortly before the Meuse-Argonne began. And the battle actually went very well. The front line changes. This, this salient um, falls back. Um, in some ways the battle went a little too well. The, uh, the Germans didn't put up a stiff fight. They realized it wasn't a tenable position and they actually were able to retreat uh, most of their forces back before the Americans could, could spring the trap. Uh, though it's not like it, w it was a complete failure, they still did capture many, many Germans and supplies and it was all in all a success. Um, almost too much of a success because it, it, it gave the Americans a sense of confidence um, I guess you could say overconfidence before engaging in the Meuse Argonne battle, which um, would would have its uh, consequences. Now, I want to kind of talk a little bit about why this this was such an important objective and why it's something that that Pershing, uh, though he maybe had his nervousness about having to switch his plans, um, why this would be such a um, an excellent opportunity for the American army. Uh, there would be two bone or, um, effects of this battle. There would be a practical one and a psychological one. The practical one is, as I said, um, this is the main rail line coming into supply much of the Western Front for the Germans. Um, the, if the Americans took the rail lines here at Sedan, um, it would be impossible. It wouldn't matter how well the Germans fought, they could not hold this, this front line anymore. So they Americans could essentially say, we we tipped the dominoes that won the war. But also, Sedan has a very important historical significance for both France and Germany. In uh, 1871, 
uh, before Germany was Germany, and it was known as the as the the Prussian Empire, or just Prussia. Um, it uh, wanted to organize into what would become the the uh, German Empire, and France had, took issue with this, and there was a war between France and Germany, and uh, France and Germany their their armies met at Sedan, and um, and the German army crushed the French army, um, which was quite unexpectedly in many ways in nineteen seventeen or uh, 19, 1871, you could argue that France was something of the superpower of its day, or it certainly had a, a military, which um, um, would have been very formidable. And from that point, actually all the way up to the end of World War II, um, the Germans celebrated uh, Sedan Tag, or Sedan Day. Um, it, it was a national holiday, this, this victory. Um, so by the Americans beating the Germans at Sedan, um, not only would it be kind of a, a finger in the eye of the Germans, um, but it would go a lot towards the French and where they could say, you know, well, where, where you met the Germans and fought them in Sedan, you lost. We met them there and we won. Um, it gave some cachet to the American involvement of the war uh, beyond just the sort of nuts and bolts of how the battles actually carried out. Um, now, earlier I had mentioned that uh, Pershing was was nervous about, instead of tacking towards Metz, having to go north towards Sedan. And you might think, well, that's not that, why is that that big of a deal? Uh, you're just moving in directions. But armies are extremely complicated um, organizations. And again, you have here uh, 1.2 million American soldiers. And who knows how many, um, I mean, and, and, and another significant amount of, of uh, logistical uh, support units. You have um, also other French units in the area. Uh, all of these soldiers need to eat. They need to have ammunition. They need uh, clean clothes. Um, this is all supplies. And all of this stuff has to get where it needs to go and when it's needed. And that takes a lot of planning. So I think that... Uh, I think maybe a good analogy would be is you think, well, why would it be that big of a deal to head north as opposed to east? Um, I think think of your own kitchen and think, well, what would it take if somebody told you, I want you to move every plate, item, piece of food, uh, cutlery. I want everything in your kitchen and I want you to move it two inches to the left. And if it can't fit where it was, move it to the next drawer over. And then if that can't fit, cycle it back to the on the other side of the kitchen, just move everything two inches. And you would realize what a, you know, that's a small thing, but what a complete headache that would be. Now this is that times a billion. Um, now the American Expeditionary Force, to, to give you an idea of how much they, they needed, um, the, it, you know, again, consisted of about 1.2 million men. To keep that army functional with supplies, clothes, food, ammunition, uh, they needed about uh, 55,000 tons. So not 55,000 pounds, 55,000 tons a day, every day, uh, to be operational for this battle. And then we're going to see the kind of the consequences of what that's going to mean. So that means that uh, a lot of... Um, uh, there was a lot of organizational gymnastics that needed to happen to move this line from here to here. Uh, but beyond that, there were some other concerns, as I said before, uh, before the battle began, that, that Pershing and the American uh, command had. Um, as I said before, the, the plan was initially that the salient would be closed, uh, and then uh, they would prepare for the spring where the Americans would assault um, the fortresses at Metz, which would have been a, a huge battle in of itself, but it also would have been several months later. And the American army was, was very inexperienced, very poorly trained, and um, it, needed this, uh, it needed that time to prepare itself. Now, this is throwing uh, the Americans into the fight much sooner than they thought they were ready for. But uh, they had some indications that maybe things wouldn't be so bad. The, as I said before, in the spring and summer, the Americans had acquitted themselves well. The... Um, uh, the battle at San Miguel had gone well. You know, maybe uh, 
maybe the American forces was, were more ready than you might think. Maybe just the gumption and high morale of the American army would be sufficient. Um, and uh, so that's what the Americans kind of had going for them coming into this battle. Uh, but let's look at some of the challenges that they would face. So from the front line here to Sedan, it's only about 35 miles. Um, it wasn't that far distance-wise, but, um, but the terrain would be very rough and the defenses would be very, um, would be prepared and would be, would be difficult to go through. So let's kind of break down what the Americans were looking at. So over here, um, I have a map of the, uh, the general battlefield, so I'll have to kind of slide it to get it to fit here. But, so this black line you see here at the bottom, this was the front line. Um, of where the Americans were prior to the battle starting. Over here you have uh, the Argonne Forest, um, bordered by a river, uh, the, and this is probably the hardest one for me to say, but the, uh, the Asine River, I think is how you say it. I'm probably saying it wrong, but I'm going to call it Asine. Um, the Asine River. Um, here you have... Uh, Romange, Cunel, uh, and the heights at Barencourt. Uh, you have Mount Falco, uh, Falcon Mountain, and then you have the, the Meuse River. And the, uh, so we'll kind of, let me just give a sense of what the terrain is that you're, we're dealing with here. You have, you have a thick um, kind of scrub forest, not, not ancient trees like you might think of in a, you know, some of the western forest in the United States, but, uh, but a thick old forest. Um, and then this is very rough terrain, uh, lots of hills, uh, cusps of trees, little woods scattered all around through here. And then over here you have the Meuse River. So I have kind of a, a cutaway of it. And if you were to look at it two dimensionally, so you have the, um, Meuse Argonne forest, which is elevated. Um, and thickly wooded, um, but hills, ridges, um, very, you know, not a flat surface by all means. Um, then you have uh, the Assini River in kind of a little river basin, and then a, a plateau that a little bit lower than on either side, uh, but still elevated terrain going up and down, hills, ridges, uh, little valleys, Lots of little cusps of woods, some large, some small, little towns dotted here and there. Then the Meuse River, again in another river basin, and then the heights of the Meuse. Um, again, very similar terrain uh, uh, to, as to what was in the middle. This would have been known as the, uh, the uh, Bois uh, Plateau. Again, I hope I'm not butchering that too bad, but Bois Plateau. Uh, and the heights of the Meuse over here. So uh, the American forces had kind of a, a funnel that they were going to be traveling up and through. You had this on both sides, it was higher and lower in the middle. Here, if you look at it here, there's sort of this path to go up to. This is Sedan. And then over here, a secondary town they would want to take uh, known as Mezières, uh, which is Sedan was the major rail hub. And then that went up to Mezières where the Germans had built off, you know, a dozen, half dozen rail lines in different directions to take the supplies where it needed to go. Um, so, um, but the Germans knew of the strategic importance of this, of course, and they had built uh, defenses accordingly. They had four lines or belts of defenses. And if you remember from the previous videos, we sort of went along what those defenses looked like. And this fourth belt here was part of what was the infamous Hindenburg line. Uh, definitely, uh, definitely the strongest of, of the lines here. Um, now, uh, the idea that the Germans had is that they could fall back line by line by line as the German as the Americans advanced, and with this terrain here, the the Bois Plateau. That's what this area would be. Um, again wooded, rough terrain, 
thick, thick woods in the Argonne Forest, and then again, woods and rough terrain on the elevated heights of the Meuse. And then this big uh, mountain or hill, probably, it depends on um, where you live, if you'd call it a mountain or a hill, but a very large um, um, elevated area of Mount Foucault. This was... Um, this would be a very, very difficult place to move an army through just by itself, even if there were no German defenders, because this was not a heavily populated area. I had drawn in gray here. Uh, there were only three roads that went through, and these aren't, you know, four-lane highways. These are primitive roads, um, you know, not, often not paved, um, and each one would go through the... Um, you had two in each river basin and one that sort of snaked its way up through the plateau. Um, moving along these roads would be very difficult um, with an army of this size, even if there was no war going on. But since there was a war going on, these roads would be damaged by artillery fire, um, you know, by the ruts and of trucks moving over them, you know, the millions of, of or the hundreds of thousands of feet that would be marching on them. And it would be difficult to um, advance up through this area, um, particularly, too, because these two roads in the river basins um, would almost be impossible to use from the get-go. Because as you can notice that you have this elevated on either side, if you just tried to push forward, if you tried to use the, river, the roads along the rivers to just advance, you would have German forces on either side that would have an advantage of the elevation to shoot down on the advancing American forces. So that meant that the Americans on the road had to be uh, kept pace with Americans advancing up through the woods, through the rough terrain on either side to make sure the roads could stay usable. Um, but uh, they did come up with a, a plan that would try to overcome these difficulties and these, um, these defensive lines. And the idea um, was actually uh, so simple that you could even say that it was it was reckless. Um, if you look at the broader scheme that would be going on in the in the battle, the Allies would be attacking all along the Western Front, so the Germans wouldn't be able to to just move reinforcements to um, in one spot or another. They would have to be fighting all along this way, and. The idea was that these lines, uh, these defensive lines, would be, at the beginning of the battle, relatively um, loosely manned. Um, the idea being that when any attacking force would attack the first or second line, reinforcements, um, German reinforcements, would get to the third or fourth line before they could they could be reached. But the hope was, if we attack hard and we attack fast will just push through all of these lines before the Germans can have them sufficiently manned. Um, so this was the, the plan, so to speak, that the American army would, would attack and would attack quickly. And um, within three, four, five days at the most, it would have hammered through these lines before the Germans could send in reinforcements and reach up to the um, Baron Court Heights. Because everything above here really opens up. The forests thin out, the hills are gone. This is, this is plains. This is where the, the rough terrain is. This is where the fighting would be, would be uh, you know, the hardest. So the idea is that if they struck hard and fast, they could get through there before the Germans could react. And then instead of the Americans pushing through the difficult terrain, they could camp out on this, this, um, these heights, you know, and take advantage of the woods and the elevated ground as their own defense. And then they could take a day or two to rest. If the Germans wanted to try to counterattack, they would have to come to them in the difficult terrain. Then the Americans would push forward and take Sedan. Um, and again, maybe another four or five days, you know, the idea being this whole operation, uh, you know, we're starting at the end of September, you know, certainly by the end of October, uh, Sedan would be in American hands and the whole uh, Western Front 
of the Germans were holding would, would start to collapse. Um, as you'll see, that this, um, this was far too optimistic. Uh, the American soldiers weren't really trained extensively or prepared on dealing with uh, trench defenses, uh, pillboxes, bunkers, things like that, uh, because the thought was they wouldn't be dealing with them very much. That, that where those things were, they would be mostly man, uh, unmanned or loosely manned by Germans. They would push through in a couple of days, and the real fighting would be out here in the plains and open warfare, which is what the Americans had been training for heavily. You know, um, as I talked about other one, you know, kind of having guts and being a good shot. That's what you know really would matter. Um, complicated tactics about having one series of soldiers. Pi uh, provide cover fire while others snuck up to a bunker and threw a grenade in. Um, that wasn't something that was really practiced that much. It's just because it wasn't viewed as what most of the battle was going to look like. Um, so the idea was that in these open plains, the Americans with their superior numbers, with their superior marksmanship, with their better equipment, would crush the Germans. This would be a massive victory for the Americans. Um, as you uh, can imagine, with most military plans, they never go as well as um, as the, that uh, one might, or as they the planners would hope. Um, Pershing and, and uh, his support staff were far too optimistic. They overestimated their own troops, and they underestimated the um, doggedness and effectiveness of the Germans. And they didn't really fully appreciate the the impact that this that this rugged terrain and this lack of good roads uh, would provide. And what ends up happening is we'll see that instead of the majority of the battle being fought out here in the open with a quick advance through this rough terrain, uh, it's flip flopped. That much of the battle is going to take place in this mess of th thick terrain, and uh, the sh relatively shorter part of the battle will be. Um, in the more open terrain. Now uh, we'll go through and you'll see in details and I'm sure as we we go through this you're going to see I'm going to discuss decisions that were made, plans that were made and you'll think to yourself well, that that was stupid you know the, the, this was idiotic why would they do that? But um, I would I'd caution, caution you as we go through here to to be very careful about judging people with in hindsight because hindsight it's, it's as they say 2020 we knew what the consequences would be, um, but uh, but they didn't. And, and in some ways, the plan, it did make sense. It was optimistic, but it, it wasn't like um, it wasn't like it was crazy. Um, in fact, had Pershing been more more cautious, perhaps Pershing, uh, you know, was going to do a more gradual, you know, step by step, slowly advancing with artillery support, um, you know. Maybe he, if he had done that, maybe he wouldn't have been able to break through these German defensive lines. And today we would be studying this and we would say, why wasn't Pershing more aggressive? You know, he had the, the advantages of troop, of numbers and supplies. He should have just attacked. Um, you know, but he was too cautious and it cost Americans far too many lives. Um, you know, and so that's the thing that we have. But now, as history is written, in reality, we would say, well, Pershing was too aggressive and it cost too many lives. He should have been more cautious moving through. He should have prepared his men uh, and moved through it at a slower pace um, through this rough terrain uh, to, so the supplies could keep pace. You know, too many uh, lives were lost needlessly. And again, I, I, I think it, you know, I think it's important you can come to your own judgments. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with claiming that something was a mistake or not. But I, I think it's always good to take such observations with a big grain of salt, um, just because we we can never really say what would have happened. Um, and with that said, we're going to start moving into the battle proper. The battle was conducted in, in three different phases, uh, starting on September 26, 1918, and the battle would continue to literally the very last second of the war, um, on November 11th, 19, um, 1918. And... Uh, with that said, I hope this gives you a little bit of the context of the events coming into it. And um, I'll start the next video with, again, another real brief uh, just run over. But then we'll actually get into the battle itself of the Meuse Argonne and the, um, the uh, challenges and the um, ups and downs of the, uh, 
American Expeditionary Force um, as it fought its its major and premier battle of the First World War. Uh, thank you for your time. Hope you enjoyed.